Hello everyone. The second session of our workshop on uh, advocacy for the environment and climate change deals with the rights and constitutional issues. Uh, if you prefer, maybe we can talk about legal and constitutional issues. I'll share my screen and uh, then take you through the presentation. So we begin with the uh, consideration of the legal and constitutional aspects of, in, of uh, advocacy for the environment by uh, reflecting on one of the prayers that Pope Francis gave us at the end of his document, Laudato Si. This is just an extract from uh, one of those prayers. <clears throat> so let us say together, all powerful God, Teach us to discover the worth of each thing, to be filled with awe and contemplation, to recognize that we are profoundly united with every creature as we journey towards your infinite light. We thank you for being with us each day. Encourage us, we pray, in our struggle for justice, love, and peace. Amen. I want to cover four aspects in this uh, workshop, in this presentation. The first of them is about the difference between advocacy and lobbying. Secondly, the constitutional and legal approaches that we take as advocates. Thirdly, something about the techniques and principles of advocacy in the public policy field. And fourthly, just some brief uh, reflections on environmental rights, what they are. We'll look at some actual examples. So advocacy or lobbying. We don't want to get too uh, distracted by words or hung up on small differences of meaning. But I think it is important to understand that these are two different things. Uh, and I'm aware that in some parts of the world, these words are used interchangeably, especially in Europe, where everybody who is trying to influence a policy is called a lobbyist. But in the English speaking world, particularly perhaps in the United States and similar places, the word lobbying has a particular kind of meaning. Lobbying is often, most of the time, about sectional interests we might say narrow interests, rather than about you know, the community, the society as a whole. People who are lobbying are usually trying to gain some sort of privilege or special treatment. They are, we might say, pushing an agenda because it's in their interests to do so. And this means that there are almost always winners and losers when it comes to lobbying. You can think of simple examples. We know that some of the big multinational corporations, the industries like the oil industry, the mining industry, they're very strong lobbyists. They get hold of governments, particularly in developing countries, and as I say, try to push their agenda. They want permission to mine here, to drill for oil there, to make a pipeline or whatever it is. <clears throat> and often, if they win that, well, they do very well. Their shareholders do very well. They win. Um, but maybe the local people who've lived in that area lose if the environment is degraded or harmed by that new mine or that new oil field, then the local people can be the losers and so on. So lobbying has this aspect of winners and losers about it. And that's because it is seeking an advantage for me or my community, my constituency, my company. Um, in some of our countries, which are still unfortunately affected by tribalism and ethnic rivalries, we see sometimes lobbying working there too, that, that you know, my people must get special treatment from the government as opposed to those other people who live a little bit further away or you know, on the other side of the mountain. We're not worried about them, worried about me. 
and my people. That's lobbying. Advocacy is different. First and foremost, advocacy is about speaking on behalf of other people, not on behalf of yourself. An advocate in legal cir circles, in, in court parlance, uh, is somebody who goes to court to speak on behalf of you, on behalf of someone who's been charged with a crime or has some kind of uh, um, legal challenge that they need to meet. And the word advocacy or advocate comes from two Latin words, ad vocare. Vocare means to speak. Ad means to speak to. You are speaking to the court, the judge, the power on behalf of other people. And for that reason, advocacy is not a selfish or a competitive undertaking. It looks towards the common good, the greater good, if you like. It looks beyond just the narrow interests of the people who happen to be doing the talking. Now, many the politicians, community leaders, business people, speak about the environment. We're very much used to that. And some of them are genuine advocates, promoting environmental rights, promoting the good of the whole planet, and therefore, of course, the good of everybody on the planet. But others are, in fact, lobbyists, trying to promote the interests of one sector over and above others. You could even say that certain countries in this world behave as lobbyists because they want to push their own national interests as one country uh, over and above everybody else. You see that again most noticeably with the richest countries, the most developed countries, who at the moment are very reluctant um, to reduce their carbon dioxide output to the extent that is necessary to address climate change. And instead, they, they try to put the burden more on the developing countries. So that's an example, you might say, of lobbying even at an international level. Closer to home in our own countries, I'm sure we can think of many examples I've already mentioned, things like the oil industry, the mining industries, there's also agribusiness, uh, nuclear power industry, and so on. So one must be very much aware of the difference between genuine advocates speaking on behalf of the wider community, the wider interests of society, the common good, to use that term from Catholic social teaching, the common good of society. Them on the one hand, and on the other hand, the lobbyists who have, are pursuing a narrower, usually more selfish agenda. Second thing I want to talk about is then the constitutional and legal approaches. First thing about uh, advocacy is that it identifies and claims rights. It's not about claiming special treatment or extra privileges or extra entitlements, but rather about rights. Where do we find those rights? Well, if we have a good constitution in our country, we will find those rights set out. In, in a chapter of the constitution, usually called a bill of rights or a charter or something like that. We may find them also in some of the international instruments like the African Charter on Human and People's Rights. And of course, the United Nations Charter on Human Rights. And there are many, many others. As Christians, we also um, recognize that rights come to us in an inherent sense. We are born with those rights because we are children of God, because we have been made, created in the image of God. And therefore we, we carry a higher level of dignity, God-given dignity. And from that dignity as people come our rights, whether or not they are recognized in a written document written by people. So even if you don't have a nice constitution in your country that tells you what your rights are, you still have those rights because you still have human dignity having been created in God's image. The second legal aspect of all of this is that advocacy follows a legal path. That is a law-centered path. Now, 
there are many other ways of claiming your rights. And again, we are familiar in Africa, other parts of the world too, with the need sometimes to, you know, take to the streets, to mobilize people, to take militant action of one kind or another, um, you know, get onto the, the protests, sometimes even to take up arms in extreme situations or against oppression. But advocacy is slightly different. It's not to say that more militant means of claiming your rights are unacceptable, but advocacy concentrates on the law and on what the uh, laws, both our domestic laws in our countries and our regional legal systems, such as uh, the international uh, treaties and uh, conventions and so on that I've mentioned, what they say, um, and other aspects of international humanitarian law. In other words, to do advocacy, we can always find what we call an instrument, a law, somewhere that we can uh, depend upon, rely upon, that we can use in order to formulate the advocacy that we are doing. So when we go to our parliament, let us say, or to our government or to court um, to pursue um, an environmental end, something to do with environmental justice, for example, uh, we are going to equip ourselves with legal backing one kind or another. Advocacy also demands fairness and justice and consistency. And now once again, the true lobbyist is not really concerned with fairness. He or she just wants a particular advantage. They just want a particular outcome that suits them. Whether or not it's fair to other people is not really their problem. Whereas advocacy is interested in fairness. And it does happen sometimes that we as advocates uh, in this kind of work perhaps have to be a little bit critical about what we are asking for, uh, or at least look widely. We see this again in the area of the environment where we know that, for example, if we were to succeed in advocacy around fossil fuels and the reduction in the use of things like coal and oil and so on, um, Many, many people currently working in the coal industry, in the oil industry would lose their jobs. We have to be aware of that. We have to find ways in which they can also be treated with the necessary fairness and the necessary justice. That's why we often hear about the just transition uh, to sustainable energy, to a, to a greener future and so on. When we do advocacy, we are participating in democratic governance. And again, we might not always realize this. It's a very important point. If we live in democracies, then we have the right as citizens, subjects of a democratic country, to take part in the way that the country is run, not just every five years by voting for people, but also in between the elections. We have a right to make our voices heard, to bring our concerns and our suggestions and so on to the attention of the people uh, whom we have put into place to govern us in parliaments and governments. So when we do that advocacy, we are participating. And again, that kind of participation is something that flows from our human dignity, part of our God-given human dignity, the right to participate in decisions that affect the way that our lives are lived. We don't have to sit back and let other people rule us with no consideration for our wishes. When we do advocacy, we're also helping to create good laws and policies or to prevent or undo bad ones. And that's a very important part of the work that, for example, a Catholic parliamentary liaison office does, um, is to look at laws while they are being debated in parliament and to make submissions and say, well, we think that this part of the law is good, this part of the law we don't think is good for the following reasons. So again, we are participating, helping to create, improve the laws and the policies that govern us. And in all of that, we are helping to build a well-functioning democracy. So you can see good 
civil society advocacy goes beyond just claiming rights, just speaking up for a community or a group of people that are perhaps being marginalized or neglected. It's about building democracy and building in particular a well-functioning democracy. This graphic helps, I think, to uh, understand, helps us to understand what a well-functioning democracy should look like and how advocacy fits into it. So in the middle of the diagram, we have parliament and the various different organs of government. That could be you know, government ministries, government departments, all sorts of institutions and statutory bodies and so on. Our advocacy as people working in this field of public policy uh, tends to be aimed mostly at parliament and organs of government. The red circle on the outside is the different or contains the different forces of influence. Now, lots and lots of different people and, and groups and institutions and so on trends are, are influencing parliament and government all the time. It's happening day and night. We have to try to make sure that those forces of influence are held in the correct balance. And this diagram suggests what proper balance is. On the left hand side, in blue, you have the agenda of sectoral interests. This is again the lobbying that's going on from different political constitu constituencies, from businesses and industries, all sorts of geopolitical forces, other governments elsewhere in the world and so on. They are trying to pull parliament and government towards their side. They're trying to get them on their side, if you like, trying to get agreement or the agenda of their particular sectoral interests. On the right-hand side of the diagram, in the brown color, you have the agenda of the common good. And here you have the different forces of civil society, the faith community and others, also trying to exert an influence, also trying to pull parliament and government towards their side. But their side is the side of the common good, the whole society, not just small sectoral interests. And then in the green, you have very important forces of the media, both the local media, talking to our own people in our own countries, and the international media, which exerts huge influence on individual governments, and also has a huge influence at international level. You only have to think of the major social media companies to understand how powerful they can be internationally. So all of those forces, uh, the sectoral forces, the common good forces, and the media, if you like, need to be exerting more or less the same kind of influence, or at least none of them should be overly influential in order for the well-functioning democracy to work and for the forces of influence to be in balance. If they aren't, we then have something like this where the sectoral interests have managed to win, if you like, they have managed to pull parliament and government over closer to their way of seeing things, answering their demands. And I'm sure that we can all think of many, many examples uh, where this has happened in our countries. Um, often, perhaps almost always, it goes hand in hand with bribery and corruption and all sorts of underhand practices. That is how these sectoral interests get their way. They've got money, they've got power, uh, and they use that to pull uh, parliament, members of parliament, polit political leaders, government leaders, over to their side. And you see then that there is a fracture, a break, a gap created between parliament and government and the organs of civil society and the faith community and so on the agenda of the common good. We then find it more and more difficult to get the attention of government because they are, to use the phrase, already in bed with 
the sectoral interests. When that happens, you also very often find that the media has been put under some sort of muzzle or control um, so that they can't alert us to what's going on. Remember, the media is our chief means of knowing what's going on. You know, we sign into that news site, we turn on the television news, we check our social media, we want to know what's going on. And so it's very often the case in these circumstances that uh, the powers that be will take steps to control uh, the media to diminish its role. So this is a situation of imbalanced forces of influence, and it results very much in a dysfunctional democracy. Here in South Africa, in uh, what are called the Zuma years, period from uh, roughly 2009 to 2018, um, we got very much into this sort of situation where some very, very powerful business interests managed to capture much of our political leadership, of our government leadership. And many of you will be familiar with the phrase state capture. We talk about that, um, meaning that the state was captured, was brought over to the side of the uh, narrow sectoral interests of certain um, important business forces. Hopefully we are coming out of that now to an extent. These two uh, diagrams are very simple. Um, one could talk in more nuanced terms about many of these things, but I hope that they just help to illustrate the idea of uh, what a well-functioning democracy is and where this role of advocacy, civil society advocacy comes in. Um, and when that civil society advocacy, faith community advocacy is weakened or made impossible or made very, very difficult, then we are more likely to see this kind of dysfunctional democracy. Next point is around parliaments themselves. Again, many of us in this workshop are working in, in and around our national parliaments. Why do parliaments matter so much? Well, to quote from the South African constitution, the National Assembly is elected to represent the people and to ensure government by the people under the constitution. It does this by providing a national forum for public consideration of issues, by passing legislation, and by scrutinizing and overseeing executive action. So our constitution tells us that parliament must do three basic things. One, it must be a national forum for public consideration of issues. Two, it must pass legislation. And three, it must oversee executive action. And if we bring this back now to uh, advocacy on behalf of the environment, and climate change, and so on, well, we want our parliament to be a national forum for, for the public consideration of issues around the environment. We want our MPs to be aware, properly informed, to take this whole matter seriously. We want the opportunity to make submissions to them. Um, it might be to our parliamentary committees dealing with mining, uh, dealing with minerals and energy, with how we generate electricity, uh, all sorts of things like that. But it must be consideration in public and it must allow for us as the public to take part. We also want our parliament to pass the necessary legislation, environmental legislation that's going to address our environmental needs. And we want our parliament to oversee the actions of the executive, the executive, of course, being the government, the government ministers and departments. We need parliament to make sure that they are planning correctly for climate change, um, that they are looking for alternatives to the use of, of fossil fuels, that they are undertaking the necessary studies um, to see what is going to happen in our country as climate change uh, gets worse and as environmental degradation increases. So once again, if we're going to be advocates for the environment and climate change issues, we need to know why our parliaments matter 
and we need to be working with them as far as possible to make sure that they do their job correctly. And that brings me then to the third uh, part of this presentation, where we look at some of the basic techniques and principles of public policy advocacy. Some of you will be familiar with these because you've attended previous CPLO trainings, but then some of you may find them quite useful, um, also useful to, to have a little refresher. So the first point is don't see parliament as the enemy. You're going there to persuade people, not to fight with them. And it's an unfortunate fact that we become quite cynical and skeptical about our politicians because indeed many of them, many of them deserve to be treated with some cynicism. Um, too many of them are corrupt, too many of them are lazy, too many of them are not really concerned with serving the people as members of parliament, but rather, you know, serving their own interests, getting ahead. So we can develop quite a negative attitude sometimes towards parliament. That doesn't help us. If you think about it, any time that you go into a situation that might be in a court of law, might be in parliament, it might just be, you know, in any kind of a debate or a discussion. If you want people to agree with your standpoint, it's usually not the best tactic to start a fight with them. Rather try to find ways of persuading them. So don't approach them as if they were your number one enemy. Secondly, do respect the institution and its members and understand and follow its procedures and its conventions. Again, I'm talking here mostly about democracies and none of our democracies are perfect, of course, but in almost all of our countries, we have some or other form of uh, parliament or national assembly, whatever it's called. It's a body, an institution which is made up of members, hopefully members that we have elected as far as possible in free and fair elections. It has a job of work to do. It fulfills a very important role in our society. So let's treat it with respect. Uh, let's take it seriously and let's take the members of parliament seriously as well. I understand, of course, that some of you are living in countries where you don't have a proper parliament. You, you have some sort of a sham institution, uh, which is just a rubber stamp for a dictator or a life president or something. Uh, unfortunately, uh, such a body does not deserve respect. But as I say, in many of our countries, we have parliaments that are to some extent or another legitimate and genuine, and many of the members of those bodies are trying to do a genuine job. So let's respect them. Let's understand the procedures and the conventions. Parliaments are complex places. Passing a law is a complex business. It's time consuming. There's all sorts of stages and steps that have to be followed. So let's try to understand those things and, and where we fit in, where we can fit in. What are the opportunities in all of those procedures for us to interact with them, for us to have our say? Now that differs obviously very much from one country to the next. It's not possible to um, set out here um, you know, a specific way of doing things because it depends on the particular procedures and conventions of your parliament or whatever they are, make sure that you understand them and that you know how to work with them. This is a very important point, the third one. Don't only complain when you're doing your advocacy. Give praise and support where and when it is due. And again, it's a very simple thing, but perhaps we don't always keep it in mind. If somebody keeps coming to you with complaints and never with any thanks or any praise for what you're doing, you are pretty soon going to get quite tired of them. And if you get quite tired of them, you're probably not going to listen to what they're saying. You're not going to take them seriously. Eventually, you're just going to dismiss them. Oh, here comes so-and-so again. He only comes when he wants to moan at me about something. So it just makes sense to go to Parliament, not only 
when you're worried about something, when you have concerns about it, and you want them to do something differently, but also to go there to say, we agree with this proposed law or this proposed policy. We think it's good and we want to support it. It always amazes me in the work that I've done here in Cape Town with our parliament over many years now, nearly 25 years, just how seldom you find organizations making submissions um, in which they actually give credit, in which they actually praise something that the government is doing, or um, in which they support and endorse laws before parliament. 99% of the time, the submissions are all about what's wrong. So find the correct balance, and you will be taken much more seriously. The people in parliament will give you a much more genuine hearing. And then, of course, when you do have real concerns, they'll be ready to listen to you. Next one is don't be partisan, which means don't side with, don't identify with particular political parties or political ideologies. If you do, you'll lose credibility and you'll alienate people. You will alienate precisely the members of all the other political parties that think that you are supporting party X. So you've got a very careful or a thin line to tread here. Sometimes when we go to parliament, uh, the things that we want to say out of our particular background, for example, out of the principles of Catholic social teaching, that's how we operate, um, or from your organization's understanding of you know, what is necessary for the environment, the things you say and the principles that you are pushing may indeed coincide with the things being said by a political party. Then you must make it very, very clear that you are not speaking on behalf of that political party. You're not there to support that political party. You happen to hold the same values in certain respects. But make it very clear that you are speaking on behalf of your own organization, in our case, the Catholic Church, uh, and its membership, and indeed, because we are advocates, you are speaking in the interests of the wider society. If you get to the point where the opposition political parties accuse you of siding with the government, and the governing political party at the same time accuses you of being a voice of the opposition, then you are probably doing it right. Okay, because both sides are seeing you as not on their side. And that's what's really important, not to be on the side of a given political party. Next point is do do your research properly. Make sure that you understand the legislation or the policy that you're dealing with. But there's again, there's a couple of aspects to this. The one is simply that you don't want to appear foolish. You don't want to appear like an amateur who doesn't know what he or she is talking about. That's very embarrassing. And of course, if that does happen, then whatever your message is, is not going to be heard. You're going to be dismissed. Oh, this is so-and-so. They don't know what they're talking about. Well, we're not going to waste our time listening to them. So you must do your research properly. In other words, you must pre prepare your submissions and your position papers and so on well. But the other aspect to it is that very often the members of parliament before whom you will be appearing or to whom you may be sending your written documents, submissions, and so on. They don't understand the legislation and policy that they're dealing with as well as they should. Many of them perhaps lack the levels of education or skills uh, to deal with these things. They may be very new to a particular parliamentary committee. They haven't had time to you know, study the issues. In the field of environmental uh, advocacy, we often do deal with you know, scientific questions, um, facts and figures and statistics, which are a little bit difficult to handle. We can't expect that everybody in parliament, simply because they got elected as a member of parliament, is an expert in the science uh, of environment. So we need to do our work, if you like, properly in order to help them. 
to be doing their work properly. And then lastly, just in this very brief uh, overview of some techniques and principles, make sure that you are brief and clear and focused. Members of Parliament don't have time for long and rambling and confused submissions. And they don't have the time to sit down and read huge, long 100 page documents full of scientific jargon and graphs and figures and equations and things like that. And we see this in Parliament all the time that very well intentioned people come to make a submission. They've got, say, 15 minutes in order to make their submission. And they sit down with a 100 page document and they start reading it from page one. And after they got to page 10, the chairperson of the committee says, I'm sorry, your time's up. Now, they've just wasted their own time as advocates. They've also wasted the time of the members of parliament who've been listening to them because they've really got nowhere. Much better if they could have reduced that huge 100 page submission to 10 pages, um, made it brief, made it as clear and succinct and focused as possible, and then said afterwards, look, if any of you are really interested, we have another document that goes into these issues much more deeply, which we can make available to you or which you can find on our website or whatever. So I'm sorry if this sounds very simple stuff that we all know already, but you'd be surprised how many people make some of these mistakes uh, and if you follow some of these don'ts and do's, um, I think you will find that your advocacy, at least as far as parliament and government departments, government ministries and other bodies uh, is concerned, will be much more effective. Let's just summarize then at this point before we move on to the fourth uh, aspect of the presentation. So firstly, we talked about advocacy versus lobbying, what the differences are. When we do advocacy, we are speaking on behalf of others, we assert their rights, and we're aiming for the common good. Secondly, we've been looking at constitutional and legal approaches. When we do advocacy, we follow a law-centered path, and we are participating in the creation of better laws and policies. We are, in fact, participating in democratic governance. And then the techniques and principles. We are seeking to persuade people, not fight with them. We try to be as balanced and non-partisan as we can be. We are professional and respectful of the institution. And we are clear and focused in the things that we want to say to them. Right, the last section of the presentation then is just to look in slightly more detail at environmental rights. And what I've done is just to take some extracts from a couple of constitutions on our continent and one or two other documents as a way of just trying to describe a little bit about not the individual environmental rights, of course, but rather what they are in a more general sense. So the relevant section in the South African Constitution, section 24, says everyone has the right to an environment that is not harmful to their health or well-being and to have the environment protected for the benefit of present and future generations through reasonable legislative and other measures that, one, prevent pollution and ecological degradation, two, promote conservation, and three, secure ecologically sustainable development and use of natural resources while promoting justifiable economic and social development. So there's a few things that we can just extract from this um, uh, particular formulation of the right that are, that are interesting. Firstly, in subsection A, the bar is set quite low we have a right to an environment that is not harmful to our health or well-being. It doesn't say that we have a right to a perfect environment or an environment that is 100% clean and you know, um, 
looks like this or looks like that. No, it just says that is not harmful to health or well-being. And if you think about it, if you're going to be doing advocacy on the basis of this right, you would have to show that the thing you are advocating about is harmful to people's health and well-being. That might be quite easy, you know, a badly polluted water supply, for example, um, bad levels of um, air pollution in the cities. Yes, you can show that that's harmful to health. But in other aspects, it might be a little bit more difficult to show that. For example, in climate change, it's not that easy to show that the fact that our atmospheric uh, temperatures are rising very, very slowly, very gradually uh, into the next hundred years, that that is in an immediate way harmful to this or that person's health. We have a general idea that it's bad, but in the legal sense, it might not be that easy to prove. In subsection B, we see the interesting mention of both present and future generations. Most rights that you see in a Bill of Rights uh, are to do with people who are alive. So you have you know, freedom of speech if you're alive. Um, no one is too worried about the freedom of speech of people who were born 100 years ago or who may or may not be born 100 years from now. Similarly, you know, most of the other rights and freedoms, we don't talk about um, the rights of liberty, not putting people in prison, people who are going to be born 100 years from now, that would be silly. But the environmental right does, if you like, reach out into the future, because we've realized that the things we do to the environment today might not even affect us, but they're likely to affect our children and our grandchildren and our, and our great grandchildren. So this right has that interesting aspect of, as I say, reaching into the future. And then uh, it itemizes three particular types of measures that are needed to prevent pollution and degradation, to promote conservation, and to secure sustainable development. That again is a very familiar term, sustainable development. We'll come across that in a lot of work around environmental issues. The Kenyan constitution, <clears throat> section 42, takes a different approach right in the very first line. It says every person has the right to a clean and healthy environment. So you can see that is phrased, as we would say, positively, in positive terms, clean and healthy. Whereas the South African constitution was phrased in negative terms, not harmful to health. You can pick and choose. It's not that one is right and one is wrong. It's just a different way of, uh, of approaching things. I would say that the Kenyan constitution probably places a higher onus of performance on their government, on the state in Kenya, uh, to make sure that the environment is clean and healthy. And this includes the right, uh, two things, to have the environment protected for the benefit of present and future generations, then you see again reaching into the future, through various legislative and other measures, particularly those contemplated in Article 69, and to have obligations relating to the environment fulfilled under Article 70. And this is just another interesting way of, of how a particular constitution deals with it. In the main right here, Section 42, they don't set out, if you like, the content of the right. They leave that for section 69. And if we look at that, I'm not going to uh, read the whole thing. It sets out in quite some detail the exact things that the state must do in respect of the environment, including maintaining tree cover of at least 10% of the land area of Kenya, um, protecting biological diversity, uh, looking at environmental audits and impact assessments, etc. Just a lot of detail here in section 69, probably more detail than most people would think is appropriate in a constitution. I think most people would say this kind of detail is better in ordinary environmental legislation rather than up there in the constitution itself. And section 70 is about the enforcement. And it tells you if you are subject to the Kenyan constitution, um, what you need to do, how you go to court, make certain applications, 
and what the powers of the courts are to prevent or stop or discontinue any acts that are harmful to the environment and so on and so on. Again, I'm not going to read all of this, just a different approach, a much more, if you like, detailed approach than we find in the South African constitution. Then if we look at the constitution of Cameroon, very simple and straightforward. Every person shall have a right to a healthy environment. Okay, so again, putting it in positive terms, a healthy environment. The protection of the environment shall be the duty of every citizen. That's interesting again, that it's not just the duty of the state or the government, but of all citizens to protect the environment. But the state shall ensure the protection and improvement of the environment. So again, placing a very positive duty. The state doesn't just protect the environment, keep it as it is, must also improve it. People in Cameroon can tell us perhaps uh, how well that uh, particular right is being enforced, but there it is. Very uh, simple and straightforward, no great detail. Probably one would find that there is ordinary or subsidiary legislation in Cameroon that sets out these things in far more detail, what exactly constitutes a healthy environment, what exactly the state must do to improve the environment and so on. And then even more simply, if we look at the African Charter of Human and People's Rights, Article 24 simply says, all people shall have the right to a general satisfactory environment favorable to their development. And again, you can see the importance of these words, a satisfactory environment. It doesn't say a healthy one or a clean one. It doesn't even say one that is not harmful. It merely uses this quite soft word, satisfactory. It would be interesting to see how, for example, a court of law would interpret this and decide what is and what is not uh, satisfactory. So again, if you think of yourself doing advocacy around the environment. As I said early on in this presentation, you would go to your own constitution, you'd have a look there and see what does it say about the environment. I'm worried that now my government is doing something harmful or is allowing something harmful to happen. I want to go and make a submission about it. Well, your constitution is the first place you go to. You might also then look at things like the African Charter and other instruments that your government has signed up to and which are therefore binding on your government. And that's where you're going to find part of that legal pathway that I talked about earlier, the legal pathway that we always follow when we do advocacy. But you're also going to look at what we call subordinate or ordinary legislation, that is subordinate to the constitution itself at a lower level than the constitution. And here we have hundreds of acts of parliament maybe even acts or laws that uh, uh, apply only in certain states or provinces in our countries. And they affect all sorts of environmental matters, uh, protections, health and safety questions, conservation, wildlife, that sort of thing, pollution, uh, land use, water quality, air quality, what goes on in our oceans, how environmental impact assessments must be done, and so on and so on. It's an almost unending list of things. So if you're going to be an effective environmental advocate, you want to become familiar with at least some of those also, so that you can, again, use them to back up your advocacy. Lastly, on the question of, of environmental rights, just almost as a matter of interest, we often hear people talking about the different generations of rights. And it's often said that there are first and second and third generation rights. Really just means that when people, scholars, politicians, and so on started to talk the language of human rights, um, mostly you know, after the French Revolution and some of the other great revolutions, the founding of the French Republic, the American War of Independence, we're talking about you know, roughly 250 years ago. And as this discourse of rights began to grow and develop, um, as democracy began to get a foothold, particularly in some of the countries of Europe in the 19th century, the 1800s and so on, 
um, the first rights, the first generation of rights that were articulate, articulated and written into documents were the political and civil rights, the basic freedoms, freedom of opinion, freedom of thought and belief, and conscience, freedom of religion, freedom of movement, freedom of assembly, things like that. And they coincide to a large extent to the first of the three slogan words of the French Revolution, liberty, liberté, freedom. The second generation of rights followed on from that, and they deal more with the social and economic rights. And this happened, again, it's a very gradual process, no particular date attached to it, but most people would say, around and about the Second World War, particularly after the Second World War, but in some countries before that, when it was realized that you can give people all the political and civil rights that you like, but if the material conditions under which they are living are bad, uh, they're going to suffer. You've heard it said probably that, you know, you can't eat freedom of religion and fill your tummy doesn't mean that freedom of religion is not important, of course it is, but it's not going to fill your tummy. So having all the political and civil freedoms is not enough. We also need, because we are physical beings, those things that enable us to live our physical lives, the social and economic rights, uh, the rights to uh, sufficient food and shelter and water and health care, the right to a job at least the right to go and apply for a job and to look for work and not to be told oh you are of a particular race you cannot work here that sort of thing so these were freedoms from freedoms from disease from hunger freedom from poverty freedom from illiteracy and so on and they are seen to equate more or less to the second slogan word uh, equality egalite then comes the third generation of rights. Again, people would often say this, these really began to be developed and recognized in the 1960s and 70s. Community and development rights, and amongst them the environmental rights that we've been talking about. Rights that apply not so much to single individuals, but to all of us in our communities, and which are about the development and the growth and the health of the communities as a whole, our societies, I've stressed all along the wider society, even up to the global society, the whole population of Earth uh, has these rights and holds them together. And uh, this coincides then with the third of the slogan words, fraternity, fraternité, which you could also perhaps translate as solidarity, the sense that we have as humans that we are all bound to each other to some degree, and we all have a responsibility to look to the welfare of each other. And sometimes the first, second, and third generation rights are also called the blue, the red, and the green rights. And of course, we know that environmental concerns are often expressed with that word green, uh, the greenies, or the green revolution, and, and such things. So there you have it, the, the different generations of rights, just as a matter of interest. Let's finish our presentation once again by uh, going back to the prayer at the end of uh, Pope Francis's document on the environment, Laudato Si. O Lord, seize us with your power and light. Help us to protect all life, to prepare for a better future, for the coming of your kingdom of justice, peace, love, and beauty. Praise be to you. Amen. And that's the end of our presentation. Thank you very much.